Hi, uh, my name is Mike Schoen. Uh, we're going to talk about the Cobra Daytona Coupes. Uh, I've got a recreation of one here. I at one time owned three of the original cars all at the same time. And I own the original this also, which is a copy of CSX 2300. The car I kept for 25 years was a CSX 2299. And I also owned a 2602, the last 289 Cobra and the last coupe. So I can tell you whatever you want to know about the cars that I know. Uh, I chose to do 2300 because the guys in Poland who make the car, the basic car, they copied 2300. Uh, a guy in Germany owns the original, he brought it up to Poland, had those guys copy it, and so this is just one of the cars they made here, and so I figured I'd recreate 2300 in its 1964 form, which is different than most people who do uh, Cobra Daytona Coupe uh, recreation cars. They use the uh, the specifications of the 19 and colors of the 1965 cars, but there's only three cars that I know of, uh, the aluminum body cars, which this is, that are uh, replicated uh, to or attempt to replicate 1964 uh, specifications, and I hope this is the best one. And this is the book right here that I did. I did on the, uh, the all the Cobra FIA effort from 63 through 65 and it's uh, in its second edition and there's some photographs of the original this car uh, in this race uh, in the book. The Tour de France 1964 was the first race for this car it was the last race for the Coupes in 64 and they were within a hair's breadth of winning the championship and Bondurant and Jochen Nierpach drove this car and they won all the first three races they did and they probably would have run the, uh, the fourth race where this car broke, which was the race at uh, the short race at Le Mans, but the motor broke. Because a, a different group of mechanics, at least in 65, finished each car, each car has a lot of little differences. Like, you can't take the exhaust headers off of one car, put it on the other car, and have it bolt in. It doesn't work. You can see the battery here is is stuck uh, as close to the center of the car as it can. It impedes upon the, the foot box area for the passenger. This scoop puts cold air in for the passenger, which there's no, there was there actually was one in the Tour de France because the rules required two drivers and the, and both drivers had to be at the car in the car at all times. So, and then there's another scoop over there. Uh, that you can see that is for the uh, the body or the, of the uh, driver, and then this vertical standpipe uh, directs air from another scoop that's on the top of the hood that goes to the driver's feet. And the driver's feet can get real hot uh, on those pedals because uh, there's a lot of engine heat here, and and, there's, and really no insulation, just aluminum firewall. It's painted white because that makes does make it a little bit cooler. There's a little bit of modern stuff in here. We have a uh, a fuel pressure regulator and we also have a uh, on-off safety switch that's required by most uh, what's required by all people today organizations are going to road race so but there's not many modifications to this car it's pretty close in 65 they found if they put a little lip here it would bring the air up and create a little negative pressure and help suck air out of these radiators in here. But we didn't have it in 1964. And here's where you put the oil in in the pit stop so you don't have to pop the hood. You open this up and you inject more oil. This uh, hood scoop here was really built to clear the Weber carburetors and give an equal height of the bodywork above each uh, carburetor bell mouth. This is the entrance area for the air that goes in on the carburetors. Uh, you've got a real high pressure area up in front of the windshield where the, the air builds up and it just go jams down here. They had uh, at one point foam rubber around here to seal off this air scoop area but the, air, the pressure was so high it blow it out so there's plenty of pressure here. The rivets were exposed like this in the 64. The cold air pan here, that's a, a replica of the one in 1964. Now the 65 one is deeper. It, it, it goes down in between the carburetor base and the uh, manifold. These little air uh, deflector vents, which are meant to 
take the air that comes off the windshield, keep it close to the side windshield so it can go in here in this scoop to cool the rear brakes. And uh, in 65, these little vanes were mounted to this part of the car, not to the door. So that's another difference. The scoops, of the ex air exit here, uh, originally Pete Brock figured that the air would go cool the brakes and come back out here. But of course that didn't work. Uh, so in 65, they just put a plate, covered this over. But because this is a 64 recreation car, uh, they're, they're open with the little wire that they had in... Uh, 64. This car also is set up to replicate uh, CSX 2300 as it ran in the Tour de France in 1964. This was the number the car ran. I got some graphic arts people to recreate the sticker that the Tour de France put and it was in this place and uh, I bought online a recreation of the old manufacturer's plate. The air comes out here from the cockpit. This is intended to be, a, and this worked. This was a low pressure area at this point and helps suck air out of the cockpit to uh, the cooler cockpit. They built six of the Cobra Daytona coupes, uh, the 289 cars. There was one 427, believe it or not, uh, called the Super Coupe. So they, they built, the first one was built in uh, Southern California with John Olson involved. And then the next five were built in northern Italy by a, a company called Carrozzeria Grand Sport. And they were finished at Grand Sport by a team of Shelby mechanics that came in there, including Phil Remington and John Olson. And so was Jim Culleton was there and uh, Jack Hoare, H-O-A-R-E. Mark Popoff Daviani was there and, and uh, he worked on those cars. The Italians, they were uh, better craftspeople or better coach builders than the Americans. So the, the, the last five cars are a little bit better uh, quality construction than the first one car. Uh, but they're all neat cars. Uh, Pete Brock was very particular about the shape of the car. So the first car, he was there in Southern California when they were building it. So he made sure it was exactly the shape he wanted. When they got to Italy, he wasn't there until he got to the last two cars. And so that shape, those shape is exactly what he wanted. But the first car the Italians built, what was 2299, they changed the shape a little bit, the roof line, so it looked a little bit more like a Ferrari GTO. And in my view, that's uh, one of the better looking cars. And this was sort of the middle uh, position of uh, the roof line, this car, 2300. I had driven. You know, the, the, my old car, 2299, you know, a lot. I've driven it up and down the West Coast twice. And they were really good cars, very loud, way too loud, and it'd give you hearing damage. And I've got hearing damage from it. Um, and the guys who raced them had hearing damage as well. They were uh, limited. You, They could never really do as good as a GT40 because the GT40 had a much improved suspension. But the... Uh, the last Daytona Coupe they built, which was uh, the uh, 427 Super Coupe, that could have been a car that could have run with the GT40s. But uh, they never finished it because of political problems and the lack of support from Ford. Ford really wanted the project killed and Shelby was terrifically busy uh, trying to get the GT40s to run, so he just sort of ignored the, uh, the project to finish the Super Coupe. And it, that's another story, but that's in the book too, uh, the, the, the story about the Super Coupe. Uh, and uh, if uh, somebody wants, is doing a car and uh, a coupe and wants to know how to do it right, if I can help, I'd be happy to help. Uh, there's a lot of the information in the book I've, I put together. Uh, and I've got a website with a lot of information on the racing, uh, CobraFerrariWars.com. Fast we get it to run. And if we're ready.